Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron, and I just wanted to do a little short update on a trip that I just took to the United Kingdom, an interesting little gallery that I saw, and I would like to share it with you and talk about how it fits into the world of UFOs. I'm going to take over my screen here. I've got a little PowerPoint presentation that I want to do. And this is the gallery. And this is uh, what I would say is a must-see if you um, are in the London area. Um, I've wanted to see this for a number of years. It has to do with savants. It has to do with memory. And um, I've always wanted to see this, and I was lucky enough to see it. So this is my friend uh, Stefanos uh, Canteris, who invited me to Great Britain from London, and we had uh, a couple days together. We uh, spent, we went to the conference in Manchester, the Awakening Conference, which had quite a few people, and I will do a um, update on that uh, shortly. Uh, but this is, when I arrive in England, the, the one thing I wanna see is this gallery. So uh, this is coming in on the train from uh, Gatwick Airport, and you can see a lot of cranes, There's a lot of construction going on in London. Uh, very expensive real estate, uh, very tight in terms of the number of people that are there, uh, but an interesting place. Uh, this little girl coming in the train, I remember just as we were coming into the station, um, she asked the question to her mom, Mom, how does the queen become the queen? And I would imagine for most people uh, traveling to the United Kingdom, to London, that's the one thing they sort of want to look at. They want to go to Buckingham Palace. They want to hear all the gossip on the royal family. And uh, that was not my intention uh, to check it out, although I did go th to Buckingham Palace, as I'll show you. Uh, but most people are interested in why did the queen become the queen. I was interested in something a little bit different. This is uh, in the station. This is uh, Victoria Station in, um, in London. You can see uh, it's not that busy at this time of the day, and we're um, just arrived. And um, here's my favorite place, McDonald's, I have in the uh, train station. So we um, stop for a quick coffee, and then it was uh, off, and off to head towards the gallery. So we come out of the, uh, the station here, and we uh, zip down this street. I have no idea where I'm going. Uh, but luckily, as I come to the end of the street, here's Buckingham Palace Road. So I knew I was sort of heading in the right direction. I have my little GPS. And we make a right turn here, heading for Buckingham Palace. You can see a lot of tourists wandering around. And we start down. So you see a lot of interesting things in London. You'll see these uh, sort of... Um, uh, trees and bushes growing on the side of a, a building. If you see that as you're going down the street, you know you're heading in the right, di right direction if you are heading for Buckingham Palace. And because I live in Canada, the royals are a, a big deal here. They still are sort of um, respected in Canada, and we still are sort of a part of the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth. Uh, there's a lot of souvenirs. Um, I didn't really stop there to uh, check out that, although we did make a, a few stops, but I was busy uh, heading for uh, the location that I wanted to go to. And you can buy a lot of stuff there. You can buy the Dancing Queen, and if you don't have any toilet paper in your hotel room, uh, they also sell toilet paper there. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff being sold, a lot of people having uh, lunch along the uh, the streets. You can see restaurants. A lot of people are doing the, the tourism thing. Headed down, hoping that we would run into Buckingham Palace. Uh, we, you run into a lot of this kind of stuff with uh, people on horses and stuff, and the, the stuff that is underneath the horses that, uh, you know, just sort of kind of weird. And they just sit there all day, and the people take pictures with them. Uh, this was actually the tour going into um, the side of the Buckingham Palace, I didn't really know what this was because there aren't really that many signs that really tell you what it is. So I saw all these people lined up and thought it's kind of weird, all these people. Uh, but I did come to the front and really still didn't realize this was Buckingham Palace because, as I said, there's really no signs. And here's your two guards and they sort of walk back and forth. And um, 
it was very, very hot in, in London. It was, I think, uh, the day I left London, they were going to have record high temperature for July. So very, very hot. Felt very sorry for these poor guys all dressed up with their big hats bouncing around. And here's a statue um, in front of Buckingham Palace, which is, uh, I think, uh, Queen Victoria. And in Canada, that's a big deal because uh, Queen Victoria is um, a May long weekend uh, fireworks. They celebrate, still celebrate her birthday here. And it's uh, everybody knows it as a long weekend rather than um, her birthday. But so here's in front of the, uh, the, the palace gates. I have my little photograph taken and then it's um, time to get moving on. But what you see at Buckingham Palace is, um, we saw this, um, one of the gates was open at Buckingham Palace and you see these guys with the automatic uh, rifles looking very serious and uh, armed to the hilt. And uh, the gate was open and they had a, a barricade that comes out of the ground and they were there. So you see these all top fit guys at Buckingham Palace. And I also sort of made the, the, um, the joke that maybe the queen had gone to McDonald's for coffee and she was coming back because it appeared that somebody was about to come back in Buckingham Palace. There's people with radios that were watching the street and um, after a while, I sort of got tired of waiting and um, we took off. So I never did see who was coming back to the palace, but these guys were standing at the gate, making sure that um, nobody was going to try to cause any trouble. Uh, so those are those police. And then when you get into downtown London, you see the, the uh, other police, the sort of the city police that walk around. And they're more like the roly poly guys that don't seem to... Uh, be all that much in shape that, uh, but it's quite a difference between one and the other. And as you can see the flags here, there was in London, this was the, um, the big uh, standoff between uh, going into the Euro, staying with the Euro or breaking away. And so you had the, 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 the blue um, flag guys on one side of the street and you had the red flag guys on the other side of the street. And it sort of reminded me of maybe the 17th century where, you know, Joe would get the flag and, and we'd charge across the street. And, uh, you know, when he gets shot, then Sam picks up the flag and he keeps going and there's two sides going at it. It was kind of, kind of weird to see this standoff of people with different flags sort of uh, opposing each other on e either side of the street in front of the parliament buildings. So <clears throat> one of the problems I noticed in London, because I'm from Canada, um, uh, I saw, you know, we had this uh, map at Buckingham Palace, and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going uh, because, as I'll point out in a minute, there, there really are no street signs in, in England. I, it's kind of kind of weird. Uh, they have this, you know, these signs. Here's the red the red flag guys on this side, and they, you know, make Britain great again. And I, I give a piece of advice: if you want to make Britain great again, you need some street signs. I mean, for people like Canada, I was I was in Manchester, I was in London, I was in Liverpool, and I was in Brighton. And I had a map every time and I was totally lost. I mean, I just had no idea um, where we were going or, or what was going on because there basically are no street signs there. So, and there are, the other thing I noticed in, in London and it's kind of, I guess, because of the bombing situations that they had there in the past, there really are no garbage cans. So I, I found kind of weird that I was carrying around garbage in my pocket looking for a garbage can. They just basically, so I took a picture when I finally found a garbage can and said, man, take, take a picture here. We're going to throw this uh, recycle little, uh, the bottle in the in the in the garbage it was kind of kind of weird. So a little bit different than Canada, uh, but I guess if you're there, you get used to that kind of stuff. Uh, here's the sort of the uh, around Buckingham Palace, and we're trying to figure out which way to go from here to get to the gallery. And here you see some of these um, uh, horses. This is a sort of a, a big park just off the um, um, Buckingham Palace, and this is where my GPS said go down this this uh, side this road here. And you had these horses walking around and the big giant tree, which I thought was kind of kind of cool in the park. So I took a picture of this big, massive tree. And you go along and I'm using my GPS. And unfortunately, because I was using my GPS, I really didn't uh, sort of ran out of power to take photographs later on. Uh, but this um, Google Maps does actually work. It does actually have a little thing and it shows you um, where you are on the map. And as you're walking along, you can tell when to turn and, and this sort of stuff. So we go along and then we end up on Embassy Row which is where a lot of the uh, foreign embassies are, which is kind of a really interesting place. Uh, we didn't see the Canadian embassy, but we saw a couple of embassies there. 
And it was um, kind of an impressive place to go down this uh, road with these big, massive embassies on them. And here was, I, I call this the James Bond guy. He was pretending he was having a cigarette and playing with his phone. And he's actually sort of, you know, watching what's going on around him. He was, so I, I managed to get his photograph. And then we arrive, we finally make it, and uh, the GPS gets me there, and we're at the Stephen Wilkshire Gallery. And here's a little sort of a demo, a little video I took as I arrived at the gallery, and then I'll tell you why this gallery is so important. You see, here's the, uh, it's in a sort of a row of galleries in sort of a hallway. And here you can see some of the, um, the drawings he's done. You can see Stephen Wilkshire up on the um, screen there. And there's a lot of videos, YouTube videos. You can actually uh, Google search Stephen Wilkshire and you can watch him and I'll explain why he's such an important artist. And so we're coming in the door here. And you can see these are actually um, smaller representations. Usually the, the paper he does on is about eight feet by 16, 15, 15 feet long. And he does these uh, cityscapes. So here's again, one of the cityscapes that he does. And basically what he does is they take him and they fly him over a city for 45 minutes. And then by memory, he actually will draw the city. So you can see the 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 um, the, the the detail of of the um, the cities that he does, and he's done a, made, a lot of the major cities. He's done uh, New York City, I think this yeah, there's New York City. There's the uh, Statue of Liberty. Here's Manhattan, and what you see is that he has the right number of floors, the right number of windows, and this is basically only from 45 minutes with a helicopter that he has this unbelievable ability to. Uh, reproduce any city. He's done Rome, he's done Mexico, um, he's done Paris, he's done a number of major cities. When I was there, he's actually in the gallery, he's upstairs, you're not allowed to go upstairs. He was actually working on a private um, project that somebody had funded him on some project. Uh, so I'm not sure what he was painting or drawing at the time. So he is autistic. And um, I've done a lot of work with uh, people who are artistic and um, savants and this sort of thing. And um, so this is why I was so extremely interested in it. I actually have him at this Stephen Wilkshire in a number of my books. And in a minute, I will explain to you um, why this is so important. You can see unbelievable detail. And here's a, a guy who um, various accounts say he didn't really learn to speak until he was nine years old, uh, but he was drawing at three years old. And his early drawings are not as good as this, um, but um, you can see tremendous, tremendous detail in these drawings. This is all basically from memory, from a couple of seconds of looking at something. So here he is, he's very, very young. He's, he's drawing at a very young age. And uh, that's all he wants to do. It's like for him, that's food and air. He uh, likes to draw. And as he says, uh, I, I use my pencils until they're almost, they almost disappear. So um, a lot of autistic people are very, very um, conscious about um, what they're doing. Um, they, they want nothing to change, so they're very conscious about their pencils. Um, the story was that Stephen Wilkshire actually goes for lunch at 1.30 every day to the same sandwich shop. shop. Uh, we were actually there at 1.30, and um, it didn't appear that he was going, so I don't know what happened there. But um, I've worked, uh, had a number of autistic um, grade 12 students who had uh, worked for me, so I, I know this sort of they have obsessive compulsive um, tendencies towards uh, various things. If anything changes in their environment, they become sort of very um, sort of um, upset about, about what's going on. They want everything to be remain exactly the same. So here's some of his early drawings. I think these are 13 years old. You can see uh, even at that age, um, tremendous ability, um, not so much to uh, live a normal life in terms of taking care of himself or anything like that, but in terms of 
of drawing, um, able to recreate all sorts of different um, structures. So this is uh, very early drawings that he did. He, he was upset. He's, he's obsessed with things, as he describes, that are, are, are action, action and um, a, a lot of movement. So he likes big cities like uh, New York, London, noise. Um, he seems to be inspired by a lot of action and a lot of uh, detail in, in what he sees around him. Uh, <clears throat> here's another one. You can see tremendous, tremendous uh, ability to reproduce. And uh, I don't have the photo here, but they actually have the one from Rome where he does the Colosseum. And then later on, they take an actual photo of the Colosseum, which has you know various pieces missing from it. And they superimpose a real photo over top of his drawing and uh, is exact. I mean, it's like a direct match. All the pieces were, where they were missing are missing in his drawing. So this is tremendous drawn to scale and very, very great detail. Even you can see the cars uh, he has the, the various cars and the boats that are that are at the scene as he's um, as he recalls this. And you got to remember again, this is only in a helicopter um, for 45 minutes, say over New York City, and you're going over a huge amount of, of um, real estate in that period of time. And he's able to recreate the entire scene. So here's another one. Okay, here's a, a royal um, situation with the Buckingham Palace. With the people, and I guess this is Rio de Janeiro. Here again, this is London. Um, detail with the with the cars, with the action, with the people, and he recreates all this. And what he'll do sometimes they actually have some public showings where he will be in a mall, and uh, for one of these big uh, eight by sixteen landscapes of say the skyline of New York City. It'll take him three days to draw, and they actually have people sitting there while he's drawing, and they they go through this for three days while he 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 sits there for whatever it is eight or nine hours a day, and he basically with a pencil just uh, recreates the um, the scene. Big Ben um, here again, another one. Here's um, Australia, Sydney. Fascinating, fascinating. And the, the key is, uh, how, did, how does this happen? Now, the, the skeptics will say, well, uh, this is just the, uh, the brain. This is random neurons banging into each other. And uh, almost like uh, every second you have sort of this sort of miracle takes place where you roll a trillion sixes in a row, double, double sixes. And then the next second you roll a trillion double sixes and it continues on with this random uh, pattern that just... Um, keeps going and I really have my doubts that there's anything random about um, um, some, you know, epiphenomena consciousness in a, in a brain that is able to, to do this because this is constant. He's able to do this at, at, at all times. And the, the memory is the most important thing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So he's had done a couple that have color in them, but not many have color. Most of them are the simple, um, either a pen, a black, um, ink pen or um, with um, pencils. Let me see again. Here's an overhead view uh, that he does of uh, looking down on buildings, which would be extremely difficult to uh, to sort of do. Now, at the end, he basically, um, I bought a print and uh, basically it was one of the highlights of my life where I, he actually waved out the window as I was leaving. So uh, we left there, I had my print and I headed off to other places. Now the important, I want to go over the importance of this because it's kind of interesting to look at this kind of stuff. Um, I talked about him and other uh, savants and autistic people in a book I did called Inspire the Paranormal World of Creativity. And basically what I show is in, in there is that the, uh, what Stephen Wilkshire is exhibiting is the power of the human brain, the, the power the human consciousness, not so much the brain. The brain is involved, but it's actually consciousness that um, if Stephen Wilkshire can do this, then anybody can do it. It's not that he has any sort of special talent. There's something that's going on, uh, the wiring that allows him 
to remember in great detail exactly what's going on. So what I do in, in, the, in the book called Inspired is I basically say that people who get songs and dreams or get um, inventions and dreams or, for example, the periodic table came to a, um, came to a guy in a dream. That's how the, where the periodic table came from. Or books like The Wizard of Oz or the Harry Potter books or uh, the, the 12 Steps to 12 Traditions. A lot of this stuff uh, was pulled out of what I think is a field that um, uh, you have, uh, you know, a field where people are able to access it. And because uh, savants um, and autistic people generally have left brain damage, left brain is your rational, analytical ego mind, which keeps you in the physical world. And when that gets sort of uh, disrupted and shut off, um, you end up popping into the right uh part of the brain which is sort of like the um in touch with the universal consciousness um able artistic um these sort of things rather rather than the rational analytical thing so what stephen wilshire exhibits to me is the ability to pop into this field and he's getting like a direct signal i mean whatever's happening um whatever is blocking the signal for you and i is not blocking it for him it is completely shut down and what you will see, um, I think I've done a, um, a book called, I'll show you in a minute, called Contact Modalities, which is about to come out, where I get into this whole neurology of the brain with these people, whether it's savants or whether it's mediums or channelers and this sort of stuff. And we now know for a fact that um, people will say, well, that person's just making it up. They're just making it up as you go. Uh, there's been research done um, um, I think it was Dr. Newberg who did this research by putting people in MRI machines who are um, have some sort of ability, uh, whether it's um, uh, long-term meditators who are able to, um, you know, change the the skin temperature or um, you produce extremely high gamma uh, signals in the brain. Uh, what you see is various parts of the brain, the um, neural networks that are usually uh, keep us in the physical world are shut down and other aspects of the brain light up and that's what's happening is it's um so the access to the field is not so much um an ability to do it it's the ability to shut down certain parts of the brain which keep us in the physical world and when you shut that down you shut off the noise and you pick up the signal so stephen wilkshire is basically pick, just picking up a signal that you and i cannot pick up because he has this um condition with his brain now, he's, he's not unique. Um, I just came back from the movie yesterday, which is a movie about the um, Beatle music. And uh, the song yesterday in, in the Beatles uh, actually came in a dream. That's um, where I got onto this whole thing about the field is I had a download experience in 2012. And it was after that experience, I started looking at download experiences and suddenly came across the fact that the, the song yesterday, which was one of the most uh, popular songs of the 20th century, most produced songs of the 20th century, actually came to Paul McCartney in a dream. And Paul McCartney actually had three songs came to him in a dream. The other one he had was the song Let It Be, where his mother, whose name was Mary, came to him in a dream at a very d difficult time of his life and said, Paul, it'll be okay, let it be. And that's where he comes up with this song, uh, Let It Be. And he also had a song called No Regrets, where he uh, believed he had a dream where he was playing with the Rolling Stones. And when he woke up, he thought that was a fantastic song and I, um, that the Rolling Stones played and suddenly realized the Rolling Stones had not played the song. And then he produced it and actually said he didn't tell Mick Jagger that he had produced the song in fear that Mick Jagger would want royalties for it. So you see not just autistic people, but you see musical people and artistic people who are able to pop into that field uh, our more right brain creative people are able to shut down this ego, rational, analytical part of the brain uh, and pick up the signal and pick up stuff out of the field. Uh, here's Kiss, um, uh, Ace Frehley from Kiss talking about his um, getting music. He said, sometimes when I'm writing songs and writing lyrics, the lyrics are coming to me so fast, I cannot write fast enough. And sometimes I feel that I am getting help. Maybe I'm getting help from aliens. I don't know. So a lot of musicians will talk about this, that they're actually embarrassed to put their name on it because it basically came to them in, in minutes. Sting's uh, biggest selling song the, the, um, of all times 
uh, I think it was 1983, he said came in five, 10 minutes tops. It was there and it was the biggest selling song. And most of these songs that are download type songs that come out of the field are generally the best songs that they have. It's usually not a real um, B-side song. It's usually the, the biggest songs that, that they have. Uh, here's one of the most dramatic incidents of the field, the same as you know Stephen Wilkshire pulling stuff out of the field. This is called The Gift. It's a book written by Stuart Sharp, who is actually a British, um, uh, now he's a musician. He, um, his first, firstborn son by the name of Ben dies, and he tells the story that um, he has a hard time trying to play, find a place to bury his son, he buries him in a little shoebox, and that night after he buries his son, uh, he goes into a dream state, and he talks about these angels sort of talking to him and saying, Sometimes when this happens, we give the person a gift and he is given a gift, which is a symphony that goes into his head um, that is called the Angeli Symphony. And um, he remembers every note and every, uh, every aspect of it, every uh, part of uh, every uh, instrument, what they're, what they're playing. And he has no musical background whatsoever. Uh, he actually goes to London uh, and sort of, leaves his family to uh, reproduce this song that was given to him that he had to create and no choice for his son, Ben. And it takes him 20 years. He raises over 1 million pounds to get this thing produced. He learns to play a guitar. He learns to reproduce these songs that stay in his, this, so, this symphony that stays in his head for 20 years. And he eventually gets the London Philharmonic Orchestra to play this uh, piece. And it is recorded to be the only time the London Philharmonic Orchestra ever stood and applauded a composer. So you get these really, really dramatic stories of entire symphonies coming to people who have no musical background, who are then able to uh, reproduce this. And again, this is, uh, to me, is quite evidently coming out of some sort of field. Now, the other thing that is interesting about the Stephen Wilkshire thing that I wanted to point out and why he interests me so much is the whole idea that we in hypnosis, uh, we use hypnosis in uh, regressions for um, um, UFO experiencers. And a lot of people will say hypnosis is, is bad, you shouldn't use it, um, memory is faulty, and we've come to buy this, this um, worldview that memory is extremely faulty, that um, it's bad, it's not to be relied on, especially when you're under hypnosis that you can... Um, uh, make people believe things they didn't see and stuff like that. What the Stephen Wilkshire thing shows is that memory is absolutely perfect. It's accessing the memory that's the problem. So if you can figure out how to access the memory and um, you can get in there and get, as Stephen Wilkshire point, points out, extreme detail of um, it, it, it basically shows that everything is recorded. It's the idea of the Akashic field, that everything is recorded in the most minute detail. And there's even an example that, that I point out that is extremely important, and uh, I'm trying to gather stories. So if anybody's got a story of um, people who have near-death experiences, um, will always rep will often report having a life review. And during the life review, uh, they talk about the fact that not only did they remember uh, as every incident of their life flashes before their eyes within seconds, and it appears to take a long time, but it's actually only in seconds, they also will experience the emotion of the person that they were talking to. So if you offended somebody, uh, they actually can see it from a second person's perspective and they can feel the pain that they created to other people which really shows the intricacy of memory. It shows not only do you remember everything that you did, you remember everything in everybody else's mind as you, as, as you influence that person's um, emotions. So you can see it's all linked together, it's all one, and it's extremely detailed and it's extremely recoverable. So if you have, uh, say, uh, brain damage and you, from being autistic or a savant, with whatever brain structure that takes, or whether you have a near-death experience or a head injury, you will end, enter these states where you are able to recall literally everything in the most minor detail. So when it comes to hypnosis, memory is perfect, and we have to find a way to access the memory to 
uh, block out the uh, part of the brain that is creating the problem. And I say the, the brain that's creating the problem is the left brain. It's the rational um, analytical, and it has what's called a left brain interpreter, which I will be talking about in my book, uh, upcoming book um, called um, Contact Modalities. That is where the problem is. It's a thing called left brain interpreter. It's in there and it's been studied at a great detail, but neurologists don't talk about it because it sort of destroys the whole materialistic paradigm of the brain when you see uh, how much stuff that's in your head that is actually uh, being made up. So you have to uh, shut down the noise in the brain. And if you can shut down the noise, you can get a direct signal. So uh, hypnosis is a matter of doing it properly, of uh, learning ways to uh, shut down uh, the left brain. And that's what you're basically doing when you do hypnosis and these sort of things is you're quieting, they'll say you're quieting the mind, but you're not, you're actually quieting the left brain. You're, qu you're quieting the little voice that's talking in your head and you're shutting off the, the noise. You're trying to shut the noise so you can pick up the signal. So in my contact modality book, I go into a great detail about how I believe this works and how people are able to make access into the field and how this can be extremely important uh, to learn rather than uh, anything else we might learn from ufology. I think this is one of the most important things you can learn from ufology is these aspects of how reality actually works, how memory works, how the world actually works. Now, again, this is sort of a, I'll be talking about this in contact modalities, which is a reinforcement of this idea that memory is absolutely perfect. And it's a matter of accessing the memory. That's the problem. Uh, this is um, the actress from the uh, TV show called uh, Taxi. Uh, Henner is her name, and she has what's called um, very. Um, now I'm trying to think of the name is a very um, biographical memory, very superior biographical memory, and um, what she has is a situation. And they're they've now I think got about a hundred people, a little less than a hundred people who have been diagnosed, and they get tested very clearly to prove that they can do this kind of stuff is what will happen is somebody gets a head injury or uh, Henner got this when she was about 10 years old. She was suddenly able to do this. And what they were able to do is you can go back to any date in their life after they were able to do this, uh, say after someone has a head injury and say, okay, August the 12th, 1985. And that person can tell you in the most minute detail what happened on that day as if it had just happened. What was on the TV, uh, what the the game show uh, game show host was was wearing, um, what the weather was, what the news was, what they had for breakfast, what they had for lunch, what they had for dinner, in the most minute detail, and they've been tested and can prove that absolutely they are 100% accurate in what they're recalling. So again, this proves that the memory is there. It's a ma it's a matter of accessing uh, the memory. Uh, she there's actually a, a segment on 60 Minutes. You can actually look it up. It's fascinating where they actually go back back and ask her about a, a date which involved a, um, a taxi um, taping. And she's told the name of the show. I, I tape, we taped the show on that day. And this is what it was called. And this is what I said. And this is what the other guy said. And she basically uh, re, rehashed all the lines of the what, what was said in that, in that show, which shows tremendous uh, ability to remember the most minute of details. So memory is perfect. It's a matter of accessing it. Here's another one. This is um, Kim Peek, who was known, he's the only person known as a mega savant. Uh, he has now passed away, but uh, Kim Peek could read um, a book in an hour. He, could, uh, his, he had no corpus callosum between his right and his left hemisphere, which gave him the ability to read a book with one eye. He could read the one page, and with the other eye, he could read the other page, and he could uh, read at tremendous speed and he had read 12,000 books. And the story was that he could remember every single thing that had been written in every single book. You could just open it up and, and he would tell you what was on that page. And that shows this unbelievable ability of consciousness to remember exactly what it is. It's the ability to access it. And the other one that, that is talked about often is the ability from John von Neumann. And John von Neumann was the guy who did the calculation for the atomic bomb over uh, in his head. They were using him before computers to do mathematical calculations because he could do tremendous mathematical calculations in his head. He's the guy that de that told what, at what height they should uh, drop uh, detonate the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki to create the maximum amount of 
of, of bomb effect on the ground. So um, he was reportedly um, had this, sometimes they call it eidetic memory, where he was able to, one of the reports says he was able to remember everything he'd ever read, including the footnotes. And he was able to, the other thing they basically talked about is he could take a New York phone book and just look down the phone book and rattle off all the phone, and then rattle off all the phone numbers on that page. So again, showing that uh, the ability is there, it's an, a matter of accessing the ability. Uh, here's um, Daniel Tamet, who is another um, uh, autistic savant, uh, and he's famous for a number of things. He's able to learn languages in a week, and he actually, on a challenge, uh, learned Icelandic, which is a very difficult language to learn. He learned in a week and actually went on an Icelandic uh, TV show and did an interview with them at the end. Um, he's, uh, he's got synesthesia. He sees uh, numbers as colors. And a lot of people have this uh, ability as well, and it usually comes with some sort of savant type abilities. Uh, the thing that I guess he's uh, most famous for is doing pi to 22,514 decimal places. And he's basically just watching a, um, as he describes it, a, um, a landscape of different colors and shapes as they go in front of his eyes and this is how he memorizes. So he has this uh, unbelievable ability uh, to memorize, which shows the power of the human consciousness. Finally, I want to do this one, and this is where it really ties into the UFO field. Um, this comes from the free survey, which I always recommend people, if you want to know uh, the people who are interacting with the UFO phenomena, you have to deal with people who are actually interacting with the phenomena. It doesn't count to watch videos and to watch things flying around the sky. There are, I think, 6,000 people who have been interviewed and have filled out surveys of hundreds of questions that basically describe uh, what it's like to actually interact with the beings. This is one of the more dramatic statistics uh, that you would not make up. If you were going to make up a story, this is the last thing you'd make up. And uh, they talk about the matrix-type reality, that the, the world that they're in when this experience takes place which some people call it the abduction experience, is sort of like a matrix type of environment. And I have talked to a number of people who have reported exactly what this slide shows. And that is that at one point during their experience, 40% of all experiencers say they knew the answer to everything in the universe. Now, if you're going to make up a story, that's not something you really want to stick into your story, that hey, I knew everything in the universe, because it doesn't make any sense. It's like, I always think as soon as they say that, it's like, well, how do you know that? I mean, how do you know whether it was uh, an alien or God or whoever is, is taking you into this world? How do you know there's not number six, seven, eight, nine on the far side of the universe that they forgot to tell you about? And I've had the download experience, so I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, I really don't know. I just know for sure. Uh, and it comes with absolute certainty. You know, you know, you know that you knew everything. And I've asked a number of them, so how long did this last? And they say it was like a dream. As soon as you start coming back, it starts to fade. And the only thing you're really left with is the fact that you knew everything in the universe, which indicates the, this idea that there is a field and that everything is in the field. And it's a matter of us accessing the field, that if you can learn to access the field, you can learn to pick up everything that you need. All the answers are there. It's not like we have to uh, try to figure it out. They're all there. It's a matter of accessing the field. And because 40% of all experiencers um, were taken into this matrix type reality by the intelligence behind the UFO phenomena, it would indicate that the intelligence behind the UFO phenomena has the answers to everything. It is able to access this field. And it is taking us into the field and is sort of giving us a glimpse of what this is all about. This is the most important thing I think we can learn from the UFO experience is what are, what's actually going on and how does reality actually work? We've made a lot of bad assumptions about the physical world and that's all there is and that uh, people who are having these experiences are just sort of imagining this. You can see clearly from the free survey results that there's very d distinct patterns. Um, this one being one, 40% of all people 14% say they've flown the craft, 42% say they've had mathematical, technical, or scientific material put in their head that they did not learn in school. So this is, I think, where we got to go. That's why Stephen Wilkshire was so important to me, is that if you want to understand how to get into this field, how to access 
the answer to everything. How to learn, how does the world work? You've got to go to people like Stephen Wilkshire, like uh, Kim Peek, like these type of people, and you have to study these people because they have the answer to how does reality actually work. They have a, a, a problem, they have a, a disability, whatever you want to call it, and an ability as well that we don't have. But it's when you study the odd things that don't fit into the world, that's when you learn something new. As long as you still study the same old thing with the same old uh, answers, it's the weird things that don't make sense that teach us the new parts of reality that we need to learn. That's it. Thanks for listening. And I will uh, shortly do my uh, Manchester uh, thing to talk about the conference in Manchester, England. Thanks again for listening.